Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. Joining us this morning, Democratic analyst and political strategist BJ McAllister, and a new face, Josh Filler, an attorney and contributor on WGAN Radio, who also worked as a security official for the White House and Homeland Security. Good morning to you both, and Josh, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome, Josh. Thank of course, you. the presidential primary is this week in Maine with Super Tuesday. Nikki Haley will be campaigning in Maine today, and late last week, President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump were both on the southern border on Thursday. Thursday, both trying to talk about border security and the need for more resources. You need more resources. You need more agents, more officers, more judges, more equipment in order to secure our border. But this is a Joe Biden invasion. This is a Biden invasion over the past three years. BJ, is it surprising President Biden took this step and what message is he hoping to send? Uh, I'm not surprised by it. You know, what we saw um, a couple weeks ago happen in Congress with the Ukraine package and the border package falling apart, it became very clear that both candidates were going to try to make this a political campaign issue. And so now we're seeing that play out from both sides. What I will say is it does seem a little disingenuous for Trump to go to the border and complain about the border crisis after encouraging uh, congressional Republicans to block the border package that the Biden administration had negotiated. And Josh, obviously, former President Trump is has been outspoken about the border for years now. What's different this time around? Well, what's different is the Biden administration has created a controversy and a catastrophe at the border. Joe Biden is there because he created this with his Secretary of Homeland Security, who was impeached over this crisis. We have an invasion at the southern border, and Joe Biden is now, just now, paying attention to it, and he's being called on it, and it's hurting him politically, and that's why he's there. But does this issue really matter to voters? I, I think it does. I mean, there's a reason both candidates are talking about it. But what I would push back on is the fact that Joe Biden did negotiate a deal on the border and it was blown up by MAGA Trump allies that wanted to uh, prevent it be, from being tied to the Ukraine aid package a couple weeks ago. So this is playing out exactly how we thought it would. And now Trump and, and his allies are leaning into it. Well, the border deal blew up because it wasn't going to secure the border. Republicans figured that out very quickly and that's why it failed. Joe Biden can end this catastrophe with the stroke of a pen. He refuses to do it because he wants the invasion. He started it, and now he's paying the price for it. Not sure much, not sure about wanting, but we'll have much more on Super Tuesday coming up in the next hour. But now to this, Senator Mitch McConnell announced he will be stepping down as minority leader this year. McConnell says he will finish out his term, but not run for re-election in November. He's been the GOP leader since 2007, making him the longest serving senator to hold the position. Senator Susan Collins had this to say on the Senate floor. His tenure as leader will be remembered not just for its historic longevity, but also for his unparalleled devotion to this great institution, which he has always defended. Obviously a big moment for Senate Republicans, but what does it really mean, Josh? Well, it's the end of an era. Uh, I think we're going to get new leadership in the Senate. I think the question is, is it going to be the more traditional establishment Republicans or is the more America first wing going to become ascendant? BJ? Well, I think there's no question that Mitch McConnell has left his legacy. I mean, he has riddled the courts with conservative justices that have moved to overturn Roe v. Wade and many other things coming down the pike. But what I will say is when he stepped down, he said he wanted to pave a way for new leadership. and. What we're seeing is the new leadership that he's paving the way for are three men, all named John, all older. So that's the Republican version of new leadership. All right, now to the ongoing talks about gun reform in Augusta. This week, Democratic leadership in the legislature introduced their own series of bills in response to the deadly Lewiston shootings. One would create a 24-7 mobile crisis response service. Other proposals ban physical modifications that can essentially make a semi-automatic rifle into a machine gun and create a 72-hour waiting period on all gun purchases. While some Republicans favor broadening mental health services, they feel pausing or restricting gun sales isn't the answer. Even if this law was in existence prior to the, uh, the incident in Lewiston, it wouldn't have changed anything in Lewiston. We are putting forth this legislation because we've heard from the people of Maine. In every corner of this state, uh, we have heard from people who want us to take uh, these actions. And we're all very, very proud of it. Violence is a public health crisis. And we believe that this uh, package of bills addresses that, the public health, the public safety crisis. Now, BJ, it seems that the governor and Democrats aren't really on the same page here. 
Well, what I would say is this is the legislative process. The governor has advanced her proposal and legislative Democrats have also advanced their proposals. Um, but the folks missing from this equation are legislative Republicans. You know, there was a tragedy in Lewiston and the legislature has a moral uh, imperative to pass something in this legislative session. And these are reasonable requests that are being brought forward that would prevent future tragedies. And Josh, will any of these actually have Republican support? Probably not because they have nothing to do with the Lewiston shooting. The governor appointed a commission. The commission's job was to look into what happened, why it happened, and what we can learn from it. The commission is still investigating. Let the commission do its work. Let's find out what really happened in Lewiston, and then we can come up with solutions. But it seems some Republicans are supportive of, of the mental health components here. Yes, I think so. And I think a lot of people are supportive of that, but they're not supportive of waiting periods and other restrictions that have nothing to do with Lewiston and would only infringe on the gun rights of law-abiding Mainers. If I may, I mean, what I would say is 72 hour waiting periods is incredibly reasonable. When I go online and I order something on Amazon, I wait three days. There's no reason why you can't wait three days to get a weapon. You wait three days because that's how long it takes to get there, not because the law requires you. All right, I want to wrap things up on a bit of a lighter note. The Secretary of State unveiled a new license plate design for Maine this week, based, of course, on the state flag from the early 1900s. Secretary of State Shenna Bello says after more than two decades, it was time to replace the chickadee plates. Police say they're just getting too hard to read. The plate change takes effect in May of 2025. Now we know there is actual political debate over the flag itself, but quickly just weigh in here. Yes or no to the plate, Josh? Uh, I'm ambivalent uh, either way, <laughs> uh, yes or no. All right, BJ. <laughs> sure, uh, change is good. Change is good. All right, we're going to leave it there. Speaking of Secretary Bellow, she joins us on Brew in the next hour. Until then, we're going to take a quick break. The Weekend Morning Report is back right after this. Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. Joining us this morning, Democratic analyst and political strategist B.J. McAllister, and a new face, Josh Filler, an attorney and contributor on WGAN Radio, who also worked as a security official for the White House and Homeland Security. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Of course, it is a big week in Maine politics, with the presidential primary set for Tuesday. Tonight, Nikki Haley is going to make a campaign stop in Portland, despite some tough odds, as she still tries to defeat former President Donald Trump. And the decision over whether or not he should be on the ballot is still up to the Supreme Court. So we want to start things out with Secretary of State Shenna Bellows, who joined us here on Brew this week. Secretary of State Shanna Bellows, thanks so much for being here. Obviously a busy week for you. <laughs> Good morning. Yes, we're so excited. Tuesday is Election Day. I know many people have forgotten that. Yeah, I know a lot of people, though, have already voted absentee. Uh, but are you expecting a decent turnout? We're, it's surprising to me. Turnout seems to be very low. Perhaps that's because it's a presidential primary uh, where there's a lot of consensus around leading candidates. We have not seen a lot of turnout, but it's not too late show up on Tuesday. Yeah, and this is the first time that semi-open primaries will be used, which essentially allows an unenrolled voter to vote for um, a party of their choice. Uh, is there some confusion around this, though? There certainly is some confusion. There are some voters who think that they are independent or they think they're not affiliated with a party. But perhaps 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they did, in fact, sign up as a Democrat or Republican or, or one area of confusion. Sometimes people are green independents. That's a party in Maine, the Green Independent Party. And they think, oh, I'm an independent. I can vote in whatever primary I want. If you're in a party, you can only vote in that party's primary. The other big question is surrounding Donald Trump's ballot eligibility. There's still, still no decision by the Supreme Court here. His name is technically on the ballot. Should Trump voters feel like their vote still counts here? Absent a decision from the US Supreme Court, uh, noting that Mr. Trump is disqualified from the ballot. At this point in time, Mr. Trump's votes will be counted on Tuesday evening. There's only so much you can say um, on this issue, but can you remind us um, about the process if the Supreme Court ruling comes out at this point, it seems like will happen after Election Day? So all eyes are on the U.S. Supreme Court and we will follow the law and follow the guidance from the U.S. Supreme Court. We don't know what they will decide. In Maine, we count the ballots on election night. That is Maine law, and that's what we'll do. 
And I know Republicans are, are really pushing absentee voting this time around, but some in the GOP still claim that the process isn't as secure as maybe it should be. Uh, can you set the record straight on that? There's so many checks and balances in the process. Absentee ballots have to be returned, for example, in an envelope that the voter has to sign. And those envelopes aren't opened in a back room. They're opened in public, in full view of representatives of both political parties. And each of those absentee ballots has to match up against a verified voter with a valid absentee ballot request. So it's an exciting day, regardless of what the results are, regardless of how you're going to vote, just vote. The only other thing that I would say is Mainers should be so proud. In 2022, we were number one in the nation in voter turnout. Our elections are free, safe, and secure. So even though we're seeing lower turnout for this presidential primary, I have confidence that as 2024 proceeds and we have a statewide uh, primary in June for state house candidates and congressional candidates, and then of course the November general election, that Mainers will show up and show up with their best selves. BJ, I want to start with you. And the question of Nikki Haley, a question a lot of people are asking is why is she still in the race? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think a lot of candidates try to make it to Super Tuesday to change the narrative and hopefully pick up states. She would have to make a lot of progress on Super Tuesday to be seen as a, a viable contender. I don't think many people see her that way. Um, but right now, if nothing else, she's making a statement to say that there is an alternative to Donald Trump. I just don't think primary voters are going to buy it. And we don't put a lot of stock in the polls these days, but the University of New Hampshire released last polls last week showing only 19% of likely Republican voters in Maine say they would vote for Nikki Haley. 77% of those polled saying they would vote for Donald Trump on Super Tuesday. Do you think that's pretty accurate, Josh? I do. Uh, I think the great question, the mystery we're all trying to figure out is why is Haley still in the race? I assume she thinks she's going to be the last woman standing, that if Trump falters, she'll inherit the nomination. I think that's borderline delusional. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I also think she may be auditioning for the no labels uh, ticket. This way she can stay in the primary, she can raise her name profile, raise money without actually having to make that decision to go over to the other side. Meantime, the major wild card here, the legal challenges facing former President Donald Trump, as Josh alluded to there. This week, the Supreme Court agreeing to take up his immunity case. If you have a president that doesn't have immunity, he's never going to be free to do anything because the opposing party will always indict him as soon as he leaves the White House. That was Trump back in January, but he continues to claim he should have presidential immunity for criminal charges he's facing for allegedly interfering with the results of the 2020 election. The justices hope to hear arguments in April with a decision likely by June. Josh, why is this not seeming to hurt the former president's chances? Because most Americans see this for what it is, an abuse of the legal system, an attempt to interfere with the election, and an attempt to discount Donald Trump's legitimacy as a candidate. So it hasn't worked. And I think at the end of the day, it's going to fail, and I hope it does, because this should not become the norm in our political process. But BJ, this isn't the only case. Um, there's also the case, of course, surrounding his ballot eligibility before the Supreme Court, which could have an impact here in Maine. Um, are you expecting both of these cases to go in Trump's favor? Well, I, I think that the ballot case certainly will go in his favor, and, and the other case likely will as well. But when you stop and think about it, it's very likely, based on the delays, that a decision would come out in September or October. And I mean, talk about an October surprise. I think regardless of how the decision plays out, if Trump is ruled as, uh, if they rule against Trump, I think that there will be voices like we just heard that will say that this was a witch hunt. If they if they rule in favor of Trump, I think Trump gets an opportunity to say, hey, look, I, was, I wasn't guilty the whole time. Um, and so I, I really think that this is going to play a very interesting dynamic for the Trump campaign come this fall. But it only seems to be emboldening, emboldening his supporters in the meantime, right, Josh? Definitely emboldening his supporters. But I do agree that there is the potential risk for Trump that you could get a verdict in the D.C. trial in September or October. That is a possibility. Cutting through some of the noise of the horse race, what issues really matter most to voters? I want you to pick the top three, BJ. Yeah, I mean, I think that right now people care about democracy and keeping a free and fair democracy. I think people care about uh, inflation still. They're still feeling that. And then finally related, especially here in Maine, I think folks are very focused on uh, affordable housing. Josh, top three? I would say the economy, inflation, and the border. 
And we'll wrap things up with winners, losers, and I am going to be very literal this week. BJ, which candidate is which? Well, uh, the loser is going to be Nikki Haley uh, on Tuesday. Um, and I think the winner will be Joe Biden because right now what we're seeing is a splintering of the Republican uh, Party in this primary process while he has a, a, obviously a clear road to the nomination. Josh? Well, the loser is Joe Biden. Joe Biden came out in a poll recently losing to Donald Trump statewide in Maine, which is pretty unbelievable. And there was a protest vote in Michigan of 100,000 against him. So he's the loser. Trump's the winner. He's going to do well on Super Tuesday. And he got his procedural win in the Supreme Court. Yeah, we'll see how it all shakes out. Of course, we will have all of your Super Tuesday coverage right here on New Center, Maine, as the polls close and the results roll in. You can catch that on air and online. But for now, the Morning Report is back right after this.